Um, so I'm going to run through um, just, I, I think there's been a bit of background uh, about water sensitivity sun already spoken about today, so I'll, I'll try and run through that quickly. Um, some advantages and, and disadvantages and challenges. And then the, uh, the project itself, which is a, um, a project that was conceived back in, I think it was about 20, uh, 2009, and we became involved in 2011. Um, and some key learnings to finish off with. So in terms of water sensitive design, um, the, the, there's many, many dis definitions, um, and they uh, don't just relate to stormwater. They, there's uh, quite a bit of mis misconception out there as well. Um, so it is really about integrating the water cycle with, um, with, with urban planning and design, but it's not just about water, it's about everything else. And um, I think the, the discussion by Neil this morning uh, um, uh, helped us understand that um, the biophilic sort of nature and, and approach to design also aids to the whole concept. Um, so in terms of a paradigm, we're in for a bit of a paradigm shift where water is, um, well, stormwater is not, no longer uh, seen as a nuisance, uh, something that we need to kind of drain very quickly into a pipe and get rid of and dis make disappear. It's exactly the opposite. We want, um, we want to embrace stormwater as a, as a resource, as something that, um, that is very attractive and, and forms part of our urban environment. And we can do that um, with very good um, sort of uh, approach to design in terms of uh, integrating that design right at the outset um, of, of any master planning of any project. And, um, and I think Kirimoko Park is a good example of that. Um, so yeah, it does require a multidisciplinary approach and the benefits uh, uh, reach far beyond stormwater, as I mentioned. So some advantages, um, just very quickly around environmental advantages. Obviously, you have your um, advantages such as your contaminant and sediment um, management, um, maintaining your hydrological cycle, and um, uh, re recharging your, your groundwater and your, your aquifers, and just e effectively just um, um, uh, trying to recover a little bit what, what you had there in the first place. And, and I think that's part of what we're looking at um, with, with our experience in Kermoko Park and, and water sensitive design in general is looking at the context of what we, we were at, um, at the, well, from the start of the project, what, are we, what do we have as a blank canvas and what is our, what does our natural light, uh, site look like and how can we uh, work around that and retain those natural features um, instead of just a, sort of blindly um, going through and, and achieving something else. So it's about working with, with what we have already um, from a natural perspective. Um, some social advantages, I think we're all pretty much familiar with these. Flood management can be controlled very effectively. Um, so the, the, connection, the connection that we have with water as human beings is very important, as, as Troy touched on this morning in his talk. Um, and I think not just from a Maori perspective, but just a human perspective, really. Um, in a, in Having water and interaction with water in our in our day to day living does add, aid to our um, what we call the hap urban happiness. We we can um, find that the, our general well being is uh, can be greatly enhanced by by living with nature and with water. Um, and there's obviously other advantages around um, creating communities, fostering communities, uh, such as uh, what was the case in Kirinoko Park. Some cultural advantages as well. Again, going back to Troy's talk, um, the cultural meaning of water. And, um, and I think water sensitive design also brings us some um, opportunities to showcase those cultural values of water and of the land itself. Um, things like um, natural uh, uh, features around vegetation or landforms and the like. Um, again, so, uh, uh, infrastructure, the, the um, the key thing around infrastructure and stormwater in terms of the, the functionality of stormwater as such is that managing the storm, stormwater um, in its natural form on the surface uh, from a conveyance point of view can be a, a, a much more um, effective way of doing it instead of piping stormwater and also um, when, we, when we use things like swells and channels for conveying primary flows we can um, see very quickly if there's going to be a problem with it or if there's any blockages or um, if there's any ground movement, for example, there can be, you know, the um, soils are a lot more resilient uh, than, than a pipe that way. You, uh, if there's a problem, you won't see it until the, the manhole pops its lid kind of thing. 
Um, the other important thing there is um, the fact that mod the, the modularity of water sensitive design approaches where you manage your stormwater at source and which provides you flexibility and aids to resilience as well. Um, some economic advantages, um, this water sensitive design when well delivered can be um, very um, cost efficient. This, this, there's some pretty um, great avoided costs that can be achieved. For example, um, I'll, as, I, as I'll explain, in Kermoko Park what we did was there was no, um, no earthworks, no bulk earthworks as such in the development. Instead, we, we created road platforms that followed the, um, the contour. So, you know, so the roads ended up being a curvilinear um, sort of alignment. And with that, obviously, the, the, um, the speed environment in the road was reduced and we were able to reduce the road carriageways as well as obviously reducing earthworks and the associated effects that come from that. Um, and all the other avoided costs include your pipes and um, curb and channel. You're obviously not, not using them when you're in a situation where you're draining uh, water on the surface through swales and channels. Um, and as I'll, I'll explain, Kermoko Park and as well as research done around the world shows that when well conceived, water sensitive, water sensitive design can reduce, can result in, in significantly lower capital construction costs. Um, the research has shown that in the US, uh, um, we did some work in 2015, and at the time, uh, we came up with 35%, um, roughly on average, capital construction cost savings uh, when, when doing uh, water sensitive design compared to conventional uh, approaches. In New Zealand, it's more like about 25, 26, 26%. In the case of Kirimoko Park, um, it ranged from 17 to 26 percent for the different stages of the development, so uh, significant costing, cost savings there. Some challenges, um, and I think I'll run through these quickly, some institutional capacity problems, misconceptions that it's only for stormwater, for example. Sometimes there's a whole lot of practices, of stormwater devices thrown around the place without a true sense of the context of the site, and therefore the, the meaning gets lost. Um, and it's not, sometimes it's not seen as an integrated part of, the, of, the, of a design, it's seen as stormwater only. Um, and the other thing is that I think the councils have responsibility for, um, for leading the way here in terms of the, the wording that's um, included in the district plans and regional plans around these in initiatives and also make it a little bit more, um, almost a, a bit more prescriptive, sorry, for um, practitioners to sort of feel more confident and land developers and whoever wants to use this to feel more confident um, going, going ahead and using these, these approaches. And again, I think councils need to, need to lead a bit more and I think what Claudia is doing here with this, um, this forum is, is great and I think there needs to be a lot more um, of these kind of um, initiatives uh, happening around the country and around the world. And, um, and we need to apply it as mainstream uh, practice, not just sort of uh, here and there. It needs to be something that's adopted every day, I think. And again, um, another challenge is the perception out there that it is expensive. Well, um, if, if done properly, we have shown that it, um, it is actually a lot, a lot more economical, at least from a construction capital cost uh, perspective. The maintenance situation is a different story. And there is some work being done that Sue Ira will present in the next slide around that. Uh, but there is um, the, the costs are not um, they're not significantly different either. Okay, how am I going for time? Right, Kermoko Park. Some of you may have been there. Claudia has been there, obviously. Um, so th this is a project in Wanaka. Uh, the site is located north of the township on the eastern side of Wanaka Lake. Um, or Lake Wanaka, should I say? So the project was conceived by um, by a, a man by the name John May. He was a, a, he's a very interesting character. Very sort of um, he's a German German guy who's um, had ambition to see some ideas from Europe brought into New Zealand, and he had all the right ideas too. And he wanted to do things a little bit differently. So the the framework. Um, the planning framework that existed at the time uh, that he wanted to do this project just wasn't there, so he had to embark in, on, into a, um, a sort of plan change um, 
course, if you like, to, to make things happen. And um, so the, the, the project was conceived through Plan Change 13. This thing works. Plan Change 13 at QLDC. And, plan, and um, sorry, this is. So Plan Change 13 paved the way from a statutory point of view to, to develop this project. Um, and it um, embraced some pretty sort of out there concepts at the time. This is back in 20, 2009, 2010. Um, policies, for example, like policy 17, which um, I'll read it out to, to, so you guys can, can see that to design stormwater management, which minimizes stormwater and recognizes stormwater as a resource through the reuse in open space and landscape areas. I think it's a pretty bold, um, pretty bold sort of policy because it's actually re requiring for stormwater to be used in a way that is not just for drainage only, but to show to be showcased as part of the urban environment. And um, it was all very sort of at the time very, very exciting and very, very new for um, for council to embark in this. So initially, there was a lot of enthusiasm by council engineers. They wanted to embrace something that was different. It was a, a, a concept that. Um, seemed very, very interesting and very robust, um, innovative, etc. The only problem that we had at the time was there was a lot of uncertainty around uh, maintenance mainly, and the council just was not going to have that uh, maintenance responsibility without having some, some form of recourse or um, yeah, just the risk was too great for them. So there was a, there was a big roadblock at the time. Um, so what, um, in terms of the public, what happened was the public there was a bit of um, uncertainty around the public when, so, um, in terms of the, the approach to have cluster, clustering type of houses like it was done in Kimoko Park, much smaller lot sizes and footprint, house footprints, a lot closer together, all very radical thinking from a planning point of view. Um, so the residents weren't that keen on, on seeing something that was that, that different, but, in, but in, eventually through consultation, the, um, the public accepted the proposal, and um, in terms of the maintenance management, the Kirimoko Park Residents Association was formed, which was a, an entity that was formed that was essentially owned and managed by the community that lives in Kirimoko Park to maintain, these, um, maintain the project from, a, um, well, mostly the, the, the uh, low impact design devices, if you like, but also the landscaping and things like mowing grass, etc. cetera. Um, so it was, um, it, was, it was created and it, took away the responsibility of maintenance from the council's hands and into uh, the, the association. So council was happy with that and uh, the project proceeded ahead. So in terms of some de design principles, as I mentioned, um, John May, he was, um, he, he, his directive was very clear. He didn't want to, he wanted to retain the, the, the um, character of the site. So this is a, an undulating site sloping towards the lake, beautiful lake views, um, lots of uh, sort of um, areas of nature, bush and uh, small sort of pods of Kanuka and Manuka. There was um, a few sort of uh, um, natural gullies and depressions and basins and things like that that uh, he was just keen to, uh, to not do anything, not like leave them untouched and work completely around it. So his, his brief to us was no earthworks and no pipes. So, okay, what do you do with a brief like that? You've got 160 or 130 lots to, uh, to develop. There's no, no stormwater pipes and no earthworks. How are we gonna get around this? Um, and the other thing that he wanted to, to do, obviously, was to showcase stormwater and promote um, biofiltration and um, infiltration. He worked with a um, landscape architect that was based in Greece, uh, and I think he's his personal friend, so he came to New Zealand six months a year and lived in Greece six months of the year. This guy was um, pretty much the, the, the leading, he was the leader of the design, although the whole thing was integrated, but he, he masterminded the, the, um, the general form of the, of the project and everyone else sort of worked together with him. So, if I can miss something. Yeah. So we don't, uh, the idea is to adapt um, streetscape to the, the, to the stormwater management and um, to integrate the stormwater with the roading and the urban design elements. Um, so 
And the other, the other key principle there too is, um, so we're talking about all these things that happen at subdivision stage, but the, um, the project as, as was conceived this, um, uh, evolved in such a way that all the building platforms were designed in such a way that they were positioned carefully enough to sort of ensure that there, was, there were lake views um, guaranteed for each of the lots, the 130 lots, and with that came the building envelopes were designed and the color schemes and the um, things around materiality, um, fencing, and so it, everything was throw, thought out, not just a subdivision, but it was the whole, the whole thing, even though the, the developer sort of, when fin subdivision was finished, he sells all of his lots and in theory, kind of, he could have walked away, but he wanted to see a whole thing be realized to, to the end of the construction of the houses. And with that, um, there was a requirement for the, for the uh, lot owners to abide by a Kiramoko code of um, Kiramoko Sustainability Code, which was a, um, a code that was put together to ensure that they, um, that the owners sort of um, adopted certain um, initiatives around things like um, uh, composting and um, uh, uh, so pa passive solar design, um, natural ventilation and lighting design, uh, special uh, requirements around uh, insulation, uh, using uh, natural materials instead of sort of highly processed materials that were imported to minimize carbon footprints. So all these things were sort of part of uh, the chemical code that kind of um, formed part of the, um, I think it was uh, part of the, the, the um, obligations of the, of the lot owners through the consent notices. Okay, so design elements. So again, this was a very um, early uh, picture of what the, the initial concept looked like. So it shows all the depressions, the gullies and ridges of the site that wanted to be retained and the roads following curvilinear um, alignment evolved into a concept design that pretty much followed the same, the same patterns. So no, no modification of the, of the land. Um, Again, earthworks were limited to road corridor of, um, formation only, pretty much. There was less sediment associated with that, and there was obviously less cost, less impact. Uh, primary and secondary drainage was achieved by swales. Um, so this is not something that's achieved, easily achieved through pipes, especially when you have roads that are curving around the place. Having pipes in that kind of context, very expensive, not very practical. Um, so yeah, and obviously pipe, swells are a more, more robust um, management, conveyance um, management solution compared to pipes. Use your natural depressions and basins for infiltration. So this um, picture on the right, for example, shows a, um, an area that was a natural depression and it was kind of made into a little mini park where, with the benches where people just sit down and have their coffees and no one would know it's a, it's a detention basin and, um, but it, what it is, is it acts as part of the landscape and it integrates into um, people's lives by having this area for kids to you know, play around and people to have coffees in, but also have this somewhat of function, function associated with it. Uh, subsoil drainage, not, there was none of that because um, we were promoting infiltration to ground. Uh, this all resulted in a high, high level of uh, attenuation and, and mitigation and retardation of flows because of uh, it, sort of um, yeah, flows were sort of finding their way through, through the land, through the natural features. High level of stormwater um, treatment as well. In the sag points of the, of the roads, we had, um, uh, we incorporated fords to convey flow from one side of the road to the next, the low points. And this was managed um, very effectively uh, it was designed in such a way that even in a one in a hundred year event, you'd have a flow depth that was very limited, very small, and uh, made it very safe for uh, vehicles and pedestrians to cross, to cross the ford during a high flow situation, um, and at the same time convey the flow effectively without having to have a culvert um, that concentrates flows, etc. This particular, this particular ford here had a. Um, had a small pipe um, associated with it just for frequent flows to, to um, avoid sort of nuisance flows across. That's my time, apparently. Um, okay, I'm gonna hurry up. Um, right, costs. I mentioned 35% cost, 
uh, cost savings um, in the U.S., 26% in New Zealand, Kirimoko Park about 23, 20, um, 70 to, 20, uh, to 23%. Very significant cost savings from a construction point of view. Cost uh, savings, again, reduce pavement um, costs due to narrow carriageways, um, clustering and ration rationalization of infrastructure, maintaining the um, landforms through less earth earthworks, no pipes, no curb and channel. Um, and um, the other really cool thing about this, the way this was done is we had things, um, devices such as the one in the photo, which shows a, that's actually a, a, a dry detention basin, but it's located in people's private backyards. And there's, I think there's about 10 houses that share that uh, detention basin. And um, so there's no fences, and therefore people can just share this space, and it's a nicely landscaped, it look, looks barren because that was just after it was built, but it's a beautifully landscaped space for people to use. It's their, their private land that they're sharing with others. You see kids there, there's tramp, trampolines there and things like that. And, um, and it's in, built in such a way that it is, it's safe even in a flood situation. I think the maximum flood depth is around about six or 700 mil in that basin, but it achieves quite a, quite a lot of attenuation given the, the sheer footprint of it. So it's just the concept of utilization of space without having to, to go into sort of um, you know, public uh, reserves and things like that. So, and again, it, it results in a, a better outcome for a lot of owners. Sorry, having problems with this. Okay, so key learnings. I think you can um, pretty much deduct from what I've said. Non-complying developments can be justified on good design. It can be uh, popular real estate, as it has been seen with Kermoko Park. Um, maintenance responsibilities are still, um, it still needs further work. But I think the Kermoko Park example is a great, um, great initiative around how these things can be overcome. And the thing about the maintenance approach with Kermoko Park is uh, because the residents are maintaining it, uh, they take a real pride in owning and maintaining those spaces um, because they're very attractive spaces. So I think it worked very well in that sense. Um, Kermoko uh, Park code, as I mentioned as well, in terms of the building and operation of build of, um, or living in the buildings and adopting those practices. Um, requires fully integrated design approach. We can have communal uh, water sensitive design in lots through good landscaping design, as I mentioned. And uh, importantly, it doesn't just stop in, in stormwater. It, 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 it's far reaching. It goes well beyond stormwater management. Um, and again, capital construction costs can be um, significantly reduced. Thank you very much. <laughs>